much everybody for joining this breakout session. Um, I'm delighted to be on uh, from Full Circle for organising the event today. Um, absolutely delighted to have Gareth from Law um, with us today. Gareth is presented by Dragon Seals Growth and reinforcing competitive advantage through customer experience. Um, Gareth is the CEO of Fathom, which is a dedicated user experience and service design company. And Gareth writes and lectures extensively. So we're absolutely delighted to be having here today and looking forward to hear what he has to say. Um, Gareth will be speaking for about 40 minutes and then there will be some opportunity for questions, depending on how much you have around with Gareth. So it'll uh, might restrict the questions. But do think about anything that you want to ask him. Um, Gareth can't hang around for too long today. So if you want to ask a question, please do so at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ruth, and um, good morning everyone, and uh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction. As, as Ruth has said, I'm going to be thinking about the relationship between customer experience and sales, and customer experience and, and growth. And I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time thinking about what we mean by experience, and then I'm going to try and join a few dots between this idea of, of how well we do customer experience and how that contributes to our business objectives to sales and to the, the growth. Um, as Richard said, I'm, uh, I'm Garth. I've, I've been involved, I, I suppose I, I cut my teeth uh, in the world of, of web design and development, but what I got really interested in was the, was the human side of technology. Um, in particular, how do we feel when we are, when we are using technology? We've probably all been on websites or apps that have caused us to feel angry or frustrated or confused. And we've been in others which cause us to feel kind of confident and empowered and in control. And so for the last 11 years, I've, I've spent um, my kind of business life, my professional life, exploring how we can humanize technology. And the, the term that we use is the term user experience. How can we make the experience that users have um, better? For those of you who tweet, um, please do. You'll see here, I, I'm at Donald 71. I know the question you're all asking. Where on earth could the 71 come from? Well, I just like a number that is at least 10 years before the year that I was born. So that's, that's what 71 comes from. I, I, I asked folks to tweet a couple of years ago. I was at a conference and I, and I usually say, please tweet me. If, if you see me doing something dramatic, please take a photo and, and tag me in. Um, not least so that the people back in the office know that I'm actually working and I'm not off on a jolly. Um, and I, I said this all the time, and one of the people in the audience who at the time I didn't know um, tweeted this. Um, great to <laughs> Nice to put on a As it turns out, I know, I know Ross, he's kind of a professional friend of mine, so uh, if you want to kind of put in the in the stone, please, please do. Anyway, if you really you like to um, please do. Okay, so let's, let's get into the, the, the topic at hand. I'd, I'd like to kick off by exploring what we mean by this term, uh, experience. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and def define the term. Because, as you might know, we, we do talk about experiences, you know? Uh, if you like sport, um, sports marketers talk about the max day experience. Um, if you're involved in tourism, uh, tourism leaders talk about a, a city experience. So we use this term experience um, quite a bit. And I want to just take a moment to kind of define what I mean by, by the term. So, so let's imagine um, you were away uh, for a romantic weekend in Berlin. Okay, Paris, um, and you were, you were reflecting on the weekend. Um, when you, if you go to Paris, you'll, you'll probably go with a loved one, and, and how, you, how well that weekend goes, or when you reflect on that weekend, that's going to be a combination of all the things that made it up. It's going to be the hotel that you stayed in, and the restaurants that you ate are at, and the bars that you drank in, and the queues at the airport, and how polite or otherwise the people that you met were. It's going to be the public transport, it's going to be the taxis. It's going to be everything. It's going to be all the bits. And so when we talk about a city experience, or when tourism providers talk about um, a city experience, what they're talking about is everything. It's just a, it's a word which encapsulates the fact that how we feel about Paris, as an example, is a combination of all the things that make up what a weekend in Paris is like. Similarly, when sports marketers talk about a max day experience, they're talking about, you know, how long it took you to get through the turnstile, how easy it was to get a ticket, how good your view of the max was, how quickly you could get a beer, how cold your beer was, how warm your burger was, etc. So when we use the word experience, what we're kind of getting at is this idea um, that when we are delivering a product or a service to a client um, or to a customer, they are judging us on more than just the thing we're giving them. They are judging us or they are experiencing 
everything to do with how well or how uh, unwell we manage to treat them. So um, when we talk about uh, experience, what we're, what we're getting at here is that the thing we are providing to our customer isn't just our product and it isn't just our service. The thing we're providing is, is all of the things that encapsulate how we treat them, how we interact with them, how we look after them, how well we listen to them, some of the things that, that Mayor Ice shared um, just before we, we come in. Um, so when we think about um, customer experience, let's begin to think about uh, what that means in, in practical terms. So let's think about um, a number of very different dining experiences. So um, I'm going to show you uh, the brands of, of three organisations that provide us with food and drink. So um, sometimes I go into Cafe Nero um, and I get food and drink in Cafe Nero. Um, I haven't yet been to Gibo's in Dublin. I'm sure I'll get one day, but um, as I'm sure some of you may well know, some of you maybe have uh, been, it's a very high-end restaurant uh, in Dublin. Um, and sometimes, very rarely, I go to the Golden Arches. Actually, I was in the Golden Arches this morning. I went for a, for a coffee as because I got here a little bit early. So here are three places where you could argue that the, the product that they are selling, um, the products that they sell, have things in common. They sell food and drink. However, as you will know, the experience that I get in Nero is very different to the experience that I get in Gable is very different to the experience that I get in McDonald's. Um, when I go to McDonald's, I generally want in and out of the place in in five or ten minutes. And so the whole um, service that's wrapped in the McDonald's is built around getting me and others like me in and out as quickly as possible. If I planned a special weekend in Dublin with my good lady and we turned up to Patrick Gibos and they had us in and out in ten minutes, we would be unbelievably disappointed because we expect an experience that actually takes a long, a long time. And so if I went to McDonald's and it took two hours, I would be going, what's going on? But when I go to Gibos, I I want it to take two hours, I want to kind of linger, I want to get a drink, take the time over the menu, a little gap between the starter and the main course, and all those different, different bits. So what I'm kind of saying here is that these various providers who have the same product or service, or similar products or service, they have wrapped very different experiences around them because they understand that their customers go there for a specific reason, or there's a way that they want to be treated when they get there, and they build the, the food and drink, which is at the core of it, they build that around what it is that, they, that the customer wants. And so what they do is, they explore the context. What is the context within which this customer wants to come in and experience our service? So, you know, for myself, in the context of Cafe Nero, it's usually, typically, it's a business meeting. So you want to go and get a coffee, maybe get some Wi-Fi, get looked after, find a quiet corner. If it's Gibos, it's probably going to be a romantic weekend or a birthday or a wedding anniversary, something like that. And if it's McDonald's, it's going to be because you're hungover. So, <laughs> so you have different contexts which drive how you go there and the experiences are built around. So let's, um, let's think about how we might deconstruct an experience. So there are, there are three elements to how we might define an experience. Um, so the first element that we might um, define is the functional element. So in other words, you've got to do a thing. So if you're an accountant, you've got to provide accountancy services. If you're a hotel, you've got to provide overnight rooms. If you're in a wedding service, you've got to provide flowers. So there's the functional thing, which is the thing that you do. And of course, if you don't do that thing, well then you, you don't have a business. So that functional bit is part of the experience and that's got to be right. The second um, element of the experience then is what you might call the interface element or the, or the visual element. And what that is about is about making what you do as understandable as it can be to the people who are accessing it. Because if you're an accountant, you will be an expert in accountancy, but probably the people who you're looking after know a bit about numbers, but they won't know as much as you do. If you, if you run a hotel, you will know all about, about catering and uh, user management and all that good stuff. The people you're uh, uh, communicating with or dealing with um, won't know so much. Um, so that second bit then is, is how well you interface or present what you do to your customers. And then the third piece is what we might call the experience element. And the experience element is all the, is all the little touches. It's all the little moments of care that you invest in that relationship that tell your customer that you care about them. It's the, it's the phone call after the service has been delivered. It's the, it's the you know, for, if you're in business to business, the email that you get 
on a on a birthday or on a project um, concludes. It's all it's all the little things that you that you as a customer makes you think these folks care about my business. They're they're interested in how well that they that they have treated. So those are the those are the three elements. There's the functional bit, which is what you do. There's the interface bit, which is how uh, clearly you present it to your customers. And then there's the experience part, which is all the little touches where you where you don't miss an opportunity to delight your customers as you engage with them. So let's have a look at a couple of, uh, of well-known products and services through those three lenses. So this is a uh, this is a guest house in County Kerry, uh, and it's called a uh, Pax House, and it has been uh, number one on TripAdvisor um, forever. Um, and it's a it's a beautiful bed and breakfast. It's a pretty big bed and breakfast, as you can see. Um, but it's a very successful accommodation business. So. Through the lens of functionality, in other words, its core business, what you can see is that it is a big, really well put together, beautifully situated, well appointed building. So, so functionally, it's doing all the stuff that you might need or want if you're going to run a successful um, bed and breakfast business. If we have a look at it through that second lens, which is the lens of, of the interface, again you'll see that the, 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 the views are, are beautiful, the rooms are really well designed and they look very comfortable. So again, I would, I would say that the interface is, is solid, it's good, without being spectacular. But let's have a look at that third lens, that, that experience lens. Look at all these lovely little things, they do these little cocktails in the afternoon, these little sort of simple, uh, sweet kind of, uh, sort of half empty in a drink and a dessert. Um, they make those available for guests in the afternoon. They have chickens running around um, the grass. They have sort of these quirky um, teapots and quirky cutlery and sort of slightly different um, uh, dining experience, which they bring um, here, and they've got beautiful, beautiful gardens. So they don't shy away from the importance of, of running a really good building that's well situated. They, they look after their rooms in terms of making that sort of interface element just right, but, but they focus on, they obsess on all the little touches. Which, which means that when someone goes there, they're not just going somewhere to sleep overnight and have a nice view, they're going and they're getting really well treated because they're just so well looked after all the time. So, when you go on the TripAdvisor, uh, uh, not for the first time, they're best of the best in 2022, and you get stuff like this. Five star isn't even close to the rating this place deserves. John is the best host we have ever had. If you want great views, great food, beautiful rooms, and more books, they'll be the best and comfortable, then it's sweet. And this, I love this one here. All the touches were provided. So when we kind of break down what we mean by experience, we put those three lenses by which we look at it, and when we see it done well, as we do in this environment, then what we see is that customers are really loyal to it. They advocate for it. They put, they promote it, and they champion it because you look after them so so well. Now this idea of customer experience. Um, I personally, I think that the tourism industry is probably ahead of other industries in terms of how they think about it, because it's been a big part of how they kind of design what they do for a long time. But it's not just the service industry, and it's not just hospitality. Let's have a look at um, a well-known product, which also has been designed through these same three lenses. And the product I'm going to show you um, is a Mercedes car. So. Um, Mercedes cars, like all cars, of course, has been functionally designed. So engineers have decided, is the, in, is the engine going to be petrol or diesel or electric? They've decided, is the gear going to be automatic or manual? They've determined how it's going to break, etc., etc. So functional design tells us how the car works, how it stops, goes, turns. However, um, cars, like Mercedes and so on, have also been aesthetically designed. So they have a, a look and a feel and a shape. And the look and feel and shape and style of the car is closely connected to how it works. In other words, when you see a car that looks like this, it sets certain expectations in your mind that it will perform in a certain way. It looks quite sporty, so you expect it to have a high top speed, to accelerate well, and so on. And so if how it looks and how it works are the same, we would determine, or we would say that that car has design integrity. In other words, how, how it looks to work and how it actually works are one and the same thing. So that's the second lens. The second lens is that, that visual interface aesthetic. But the third lens through which Mercedes cars are designed is the experience design lens. 
So when Mercedes designers are working out how they're going to design a car, they say to themselves, we want to work out how the car's going to work. That's functional design. And we want to determine how the car's going to look. And that's aesthetic design. But we also want to determine how the car is going to feel. And that is experience design. And for luxury car manufacturers like Mercedes, experience design manifests itself in an almost obsessive attention to detail. So if you're fortunate enough to drive a car like this, none of the following things have been left to chance. All of the following things have been specifically designed. The feet of the leather seats has been designed. The firmness of the pedals when you use them on the floor has been designed. The firmness of the gear stick, the firmness of the steering wheel, the noise the doors made when you open and close them, the noise the engine makes when you rev it up, all of that has been Design. None of it has been left to chance. Someone has made a deliberate and conscious decision that that's the way that component is going to work or look or feel or sound. Because Mercedes take the view, our engine is going to make some noise, so why not make it a noise that people who are into their cars listen to it and think, ah, that's a really sweet sounding engine, you know? So none of this stuff is left to choice. Um, you may notice in some of the newer Audis as well, that the indicator doesn't blink, it kind of flourishes in and out, in and out. I think BMW have something similar, but I've just never seen a BMW driver use their indicators. So <laughs> I bet you there's some in, so well, loss at least, but there um, Okay, so that's what we mean by experience. We, we mean those three lenses. It's just this mindset which says that the thing which my customer is getting from me is, is beyond the service I provide, it's beyond the product that I give them. And so the, the sort of the science and the theory of experience design tells us that if we think about what we're doing through these three lenses, it gives us a way to provide our customers with an experience which really leaves them feeling valued and special and loyal and so on. And I think that's the big thing I wanted to kind of leave you with in this kind of first little section. This idea that when you have a, a deliberate and consistent experience that you provide your customers with, it generates desire. It, 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 it is the thing which allows your customers to not want to go to a competitor even if they are cheaper. It is the thing which makes your customers say to their friends when they're having a beer or having a coffee, oh I use these guys or I buy from these guys, they're, they're really good, they really, they really look happy. So, so for me, customer experience is a, is a genuine tool that allows you to, to differentiate, which allows you to kind of increase your, your prices and which allows you to increase lifetime value. Customer. I'm going to share some ways by which I, I hope or think you'll be able to do that. So that's a little bit about what we, what we mean or what we think um, by, by customer experience. So let's just define it a little bit um, further. Um, and in particular, I want to just draw a little bit of differentiation between customer service and customer experience. Because the two um, are not the same. Uh, they're not the same in terms of how we implement them within our business. And in particular, they're not the same in terms of how we consider them when we're kind of leading our business or making um, decisions. So I'm going to just uh, take a moment um, and separate the two things, customer service and customer experience. <coughs> so, I mean, I, I think, personally, I think my favorite definition of experience design, whether it is customer experience in the real world or whether it is user experience in the digital world, my favorite definition is that a customer experience is what it is what it feels like to access or use a product or a system or a service. Um, I like this idea that customer experience is how we choose to treat our customers. It is a, it is a deliberate act. It is something which we um, uh, provide for our, for our customers and they are having emotional responses to how well we treat them. And just, just think about some of the brands that you are loyal to as a, as a ponder, as a consumer rather than as a business owner. Um, whether they're local businesses that you transact with, whether they are kind of global brands whose clothes that you like or whose technology that you prefer, think about how they make you feel as you engage with or interact with or use their products or services. That's what we mean when we say customer experience. It's a realization that our customers, who are humans, just like you and I, have emotional responses to how they are being treated when we are doing business with them. So let's just work out then what that means for the difference between customer service and customer experience. So, um, first thing to say is that the, the mindset of customer service says, if you've got a difficulty, if you've got a challenge, 
you can email us, you can pick up the phone, and you can access our support line. So um, interaction happens only when the customer is stuck. So the customer is kind of on their own, but if they're in trouble, they'll, they'll get in touch and you'll do your best to help them. A customer experience mindset says, we, we are not going to be that reactive. We are, we are going to go after communications with customers, and we want to interact with them right throughout the entire customer journey. So from the moment they get in touch at the start of the sales inquiry, right through to them saying, yes, I'm going to buy your product or service, right through those early days of engaging with you, right through the product delivery, you're constantly interested in what it is your customer might need at that stage, and you're giving them the tools of communications and so on for that experience to be positive. The second difference, um, which is kind of connected to the first, is that customer service tends to be reactive. So if a customer is stuck, they get in touch. Customer experience, however, is proactive. You're, you're, you're proactively and energetically interested in how well you're treating your customer. Um, number three, customer service is defined by an event. It's, the, it's quite transactional, whereas customer experience is defined by, by feelings and perceptions. Uh, next up, uh, the relationship is transactional, if it's uh, service uh, driven, it is relational if it's experience driven. For me, I, personally, I think this is the big one. Um, when, when think about the brands who are frustrating to deal with, think about, uh, I, I don't want to name and shame, but we know the sectors in the area. We, we know what it's like to change our telephone provider, to change our energy provider. We know what it's like when we get stuck in the queue for a health insurance provider. Or, you know, the, the folks who, you know, for whom doing business with them is just far harder than it, than it should be. We know that when we as punters experience that, someone in the boardroom somewhere is looking at a spreadsheet and saying, how can we drive down the cost of looking after this person? Whereas organizations who get this right, and again, in the world of health provider, I, I had to phone a health insurance company uh, last year, um, straight through, no dial one for this, dial two for that, straight through to an individual who said, hi, how can I, how can I help you? One organization wants to drive down cost, the other one says, I want to use how we treat our customers as a source of competitive advantage. And the final one then um, is that in customer service, typically customer service responsibility sits in an individual department, but uh, for customer experience, responsibility sits right across the organization. <coughs> so organizations that tend to look after their customers best, value it, measure it, and talk about it at the board. And so what you'll see here, I hope it comes across, is that while there's overlap in customer service and customer experience, the mindset is different. The, the understanding of what it means to look after and engage with and interact with the customer is different on the left and different on the right. So that's just a little bit about kind of drawing a little bit of uh, clear water between those two things. So, so why does all of this matter and why are we talking about this um, at a sales and a sales growth? and an innovation conference? Um, well, the answer, in a sense, is quite straightforward. The answer is, um, we live right now in an experienced economy. As, as we look at how increasing numbers of organizations are seeking to enjoy competitive advantage, increasing numbers of, of them are saying, we are going to enjoy advantage over our competitors by treating our customers better. Um, I'm going to explain in a moment why that is or what some of the, some of the drivers are around that. But let me just um, share some of the stats with you. So if we have a look at the customer lifetime value um, business case, the impact of customer spend for customer experiences that are deemed to be superior, in years one to three, they will, they will tend to spend what they might have spent anyway. But years four to six, are up to 30% um, increase, uh, 1.5, 1.8, and, and so on. So um, customers who are well treated um, are more loyal for longer, and they spend more with you. As well as that, if we hone in this, this idea of loyalty, for many organizations, um, one of the biggest business costs that they face is the cost of acquiring new customers. And you know, you'll, you'll be familiar that looking at the current customers is, a, is typically, you, know, you enjoy higher margins, it's less, um, it's less, it's got less friction in it, it's a more straightforward uh, kind of transaction. So customer experience drives loyalty. And you can see here some of the impacts on some of the relationships between experience and loyalty. So customer experience impacts well to be loyal. Um, 74% of those surveyed uh, said yes. Customers have more power today than three years ago. I'm surprised that's only 60. I, I personally, I think that, that I think customers enjoy more power today 
than they've, than they've had in the last 100 years. I'm going to try and justify that statement in a moment. Customer service is better experience, and customers are willing to pay more for better experience. Um, the theorists tell us that the tipping point actually was only um, two years ago. The tipping point within which the majority of businesses sought to use customer experience as a method of differentiation um, versus the traditional ones of price and product, um, the tipping point uh, was, was 2020. So 86% of buyers will pay more for a better customer experience, and 2020 was the year that, that this, kind of, this tipping point occurred. Now, um, why? Well, um, the big driver, the single biggest driver by a distance, um, has been the internet and digital and the availability of information. And whilst this morning's session isn't about the internet, um, I don't think you can talk about customer experience without talking about the internet. So, so let me just give you a couple of examples of what has happened on the internet or why the internet is such a critical part of customer experience and therefore why customer experience matters more than ever before. Let me show you just a simple, um, well I say, I say simple, uh, let me just show you an example sales funnel. So most sales funnels, um, well there's a number of different sales funnel models, but one that I think we like is uh, awareness, consideration, decision making, conversion, and advocacy. And so what the theory of the sales model says is we want to get lots of customers here on the left hand side here who don't yet even know that we exist. And we want to get the right customers, and as many of them as possible, to the right hand side where they have bought from us and they are, they are repeat buying from us and they are telling their friends how good we are. So in, in, in simple terms, we're trying to push people from left to right. And of course, it's different for different businesses, but some example um, methods or some example um, activities might be you want to make people aware of your business by doing some TV advertising or by having some point of sale or by running PR and local press. Lots of different ways to get awareness. And what might happen then is that some of your current customers see your advert or read your press release and go, ah, I, I might need what these people do. And so that potential customer starts to engage or get interested in um, what it is that you have to offer and they move into consideration. So what they'll often do then is they'll go onto the internet and they'll they'll search for um, you know what it is they'll search for your business or they'll search for what it is that you do or they might go onto social media and ask their friends you know do you know anything about these uh, folks and so on so the customer starts to get engaged and then as that journey continues they will inevitably as they think about decision making they'll find themselves on your website they'll be interested in third party reviews they might visit your website more than once perhaps once on mobile and once on on desktop. They might well think, well, here, if I'm looking at what these guys do, I should really have got a couple of competitors to see how they, how they compare. So at this stage, the customer is interested in detail. They, they are engaged in considering a purchase, and they're into the detail. And so what we want to do on the web is that we want to make sure that we convert as many of these as we, as we can. And for those that we don't convert, then typically we will put something in place that allows us to get in touch with those who've always converted. So the customer almost converted but didn't and we have their email address well then perhaps we can we can email them if it, if it has happened on a mobile device perhaps we can use alerts and notifications to keep in touch and, and so on and i'm sure you've all been familiar or have been a consumer within this model so what we then want to do is um, once the customer has bought from us once we want to look after them well and we want to make sure that they buy from us again we want to make sure that they give us good reviews if we've looked after them and if we really look after them we'll maybe get them to share what we've done on social media so that's just a, a kind of a whistle stop, a very quick tour of what a sales process can look like for some businesses. And of course, for your business, you'll be using different activities and different specific techniques, but, but customers will be moving along that, that sales funnel. Um, and there's a number of things that are, that are important <coughs> to mention um, on the phone. So the first thing to say is that the more time you spend on the left-hand side, the more in control of the message you are. So if it's your TV ad, or your press ad, or your press release, or you're paying for that airtime, or you're paying for that media, then you get to choose what you say about yourself, and your products, and your services. So on the left hand side, you're in full control. So you can say all those lovely things about yourself, whether they're true or not, you can, you can tell the world how brilliant you are. But the left hand side is where sales and marketing is at its most expensive. So getting a TV, getting a radio, getting a press, those things are expensive. Um, so you're in control of the message, 
um, but it's expensive. However, the further the customer goes from left to right, the more they are in control of the message and the more that they are the driving force in working out not just what you say about yourself, but what your customers and what others say about you as well. So as we move to the right hand side, what we see is our, our customers' power increases massively. So if you look at something like search engines, increasingly search engines are driven by reputation. If you look at even things like uh, paid media on Google, a big part of that is to do with um, things such as um, page credibility, again, um, which is driven by not just what you say about yourself, but what others say about you as well. So we look at, we look at ratings, we look at social media, we look at what happens <coughs> in review websites. The more you go to the right hand side, the more you are reliant on your customers saying and promoting um, nice things and good things about you online so that your digital footprint marries up with what it is that you say. In other words, the plumbing of the internet, as it has evolved over the last 15 years, its plumbing has changed so that the stuff that gets promoted, the stuff that gets number one on Google, the stuff that rises to the top of social networks, those are, the, those are the businesses and those are the brands who have treated their customers well enough for their customers to be motivated to go online and give a positive review or to share something on social and so on. So what the internet has been about over the last 15 years has been about the decentralization of the message. Um, some of that's good because it puts the consumer in power. We, we won't get into the whole di disinformation and fake news, which is a kind of a hangover of that, but all of that comes from the fact that the plumbing of the internet right now is all based around the decentralization of, of messaging and the decentralization of, of what organizations send out themselves. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So if you go onto Google and you type in best hotel in Belfast, um, you're not looking for the best Western. So, you know what I mean? So you're not looking for a hotel that has the word best in its title. You're looking for, for a hotel that is the best, that is the one that you want, that is the most superior in the city. But look at what Google does. Um, Google, the first thing that it does is it outsources its results to you and me. <coughs> what it says here is, don't, don't, don't look here on Google, the first thing it does is go and look on TripAdvisor and see what people say. Go and look on the hotel guru, go and look on Google.com, so on. So don't, don't trust us, or we'll give you some suggestions based on which hotels are closest to the centre of the city. But the first thing which it does is it says, well don't ask us, but go and ask other customers. And use their ratings and use their reviews. Nair, I mentioned it um, uh, earlier on when he was, he was speaking, he was talking about his 80 and 90 um, testimonials, the, the, the reviews that he has on, on his website. That, that's his differentiator. So his offering to the market isn't, look how wonderful and great that, that I am. His offering to the market is, here's loads of people who are just like you, who are saying how well I solved their problems. This is how well I looked after these other customers. So um, and I've used the hotel example because it's, a, it's an easy one, and we don't have time nor inclination, I suspect, into the world of search engine optimization. But the internet is built around um, promoting to the top the organizations that are best looked after their customers. Um, let's look at another favourite example of, of mine. Um, Lake Ann are, are big heroes in our house. So um, my, my wife likes to cook and she likes to bake. And, uh, and, so, and she, she uses Lake Ann all the time and they're the only organisation that do what they do that she would, that she would use. Well, but she's had two encounters in particular um, with them over the years. I'll just tell them, tell them very, very quickly. Um, she ordered a, um, a baking not tray, maybe let's call it a tray. It's the wrong term, forgive me. She ordered a, a baking dish. That's probably even worse. Anyway, a baking dish. And on the baking dish, there was a sort of a hairline um, uh, sort of a scratch or mark. So she emailed them and she said, look, I've um, got the dish, thanks for sending it through, but there's a kind of a, 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 an issue with it. Um, can you tell me where to send it back to? Um, and then you would send me a new one. And they came straight back and said, no problem, we'll get you a new one. Don't bother going to the trouble of sending the old one back, we'll just send the new one. And so she went, oh, that was easy, thanks very much. Um, and a couple of years later, she had ordered something else, and there was a, there was a really, really minor flaw with it. I can't remember what it was, but the flaw was so insignificant that she just took the product, put it in the cupboard, started using it. So it was almost insignificant. But she got a survey a couple of weeks later, and the survey said, how was the product? And she replied and said, look, I'm only saying this because you've asked. Um, but there's this really tiny issue, and it's, it's fine, how do you keep the product? It's a really tiny issue, um, but I'm just letting you know because you've asked for the survey. 
and you might guess where this is going. She got an email from someone who works um, in their uh, customer team and said, we're sorry to hear the product had a penny flaw. We're going to send you another one. And sure enough, a couple of days later, the other one um, arrived. Um, but it turns out that my wife is not the only person who loves Lakeland, and actually Lakeland's entire competitive advantage for, for years and years has been built around customer experience. So let's see what this looks like when this then bleeds on to social media. Um, this is Lakeland's um, Facebook page, um, and we'll just, we'll just scroll down here, because um, I want to show you a really innocuous post that Lakeland um, put up. <coughs> Lakeland, oh, good morning, we have won the Silver Award for online home retailing. Um, but look what's happening. They're getting this wall of love from Dean Patterson. Well done, Julia Levy. Well done, Maxie Duffy. Well done. Congratulations, your award for new service. I love the first class service. Well done, my favorite company. So they're getting this wall of love. Now, what new customers would Lakeland like to get? I'm going to propose this. They would love to get access to Dean Patterson's friends, and Julia Levy's friends, and Maxie Duffy's friends, and Anne Lily Bennett's friends. So all their friends are getting alerts about these various folks posting positively on social media about Lakeland and Lakeland just simply by looking after their customers well are creating an environment within which their customers are doing their sales and marketing for them. So those are just two quick examples that I mentioned just to kind of um, plant the seed or give you the hint that, that the internet is just everything with the internet nowadays is all about all the major platforms are simply trying to point people not to what they are saying but they are trying to aggregate um, what consumers are saying and pointing customers in their direction based on that. Okay, let me give you a couple of takeaways, folks, if, if I may, just to kind of um, uh, make some of this, this practical. Um, if, you're, if you're comfortable with the logic so far and, uh, and you think that customer experience is an opportunity to differentiate or to compete or to grow, um, let me share with you a couple of practical things that, that you can do that will help make this uh, real for your, your business. So number one, um, listen um, to customers actively. So some of you may have seen uh, the movie What Women Want. Um, it's from 2000, 22 years ago. Anybody know what it was 22 years ago? Anybody is it just, just me? Anyway, um, so for those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's, uh, it's, just a, it's just a sort of a dopey movie, but in the movie, Mel Gibson, um, I can't even remember how it happened, but he got this superpower where he could hear what women were thinking. You know, so Mel's a pretty good guy, and he went into a room and he could, you know, he, could, he could hear all the women in the room, you know, checking them out and all the rest. Um, but this was an amazing super part because he, he knew what, his, what the ladies in the room were thinking. Customer experience gives us the same super part. This is so, indulge me, forgive me, but um, if we ask our customers and we listen to our customers and we observe our customers in terms of how we are treating them, they will give us the answer. So if we're wondering how can we best treat our customers or what are they looking for or what are they expecting or how can we do something better, we just have to ask and they, and they will tell us. And um, you know, it's why I mean, I make a living from this. Um, and occasionally feel a little bit like a fraud because um, organizations engage us to kind of help them with this stuff. We go and ask their customers and we run research and we observe and we do all this stuff. And we, we take what we see and we present it back to the customers who love it and implement it. And in a sense, all we have done is just acted as a middleman to go get the insight out of, out of your, your customers. So if you're wanting to know how can you treat your customers better, that knowledge is inside your customers' head. So listen to them, engage with them, um, uh, and put it in practice what you observe and what, what you hear. A couple of simple examples. Um, our, our, so our, our kids, um, so our eldest daughters in the but our, our son, uh, goes to Anthony Grammar. He's not in this picture, but this was the poshest picture I could find of Anthony Grammar's going on. I wanted to portray it in a good light. Um, so, not only, he's fine teenagers. Anyway, um, not only uh, does my son go to Anthony Grammar, but my brother in law is a teacher. Um, he, got me, he got me called into this parent experience group, um, which was basically saying, how can the school better engage with parents? How can they make the, the experience as a parent um, better? So I was, I was happy to get involved. Um, I mean, after the grief our kids had brought to school, I thought it was the best thing to do in return. Um, but, uh, so, we did these simple things. So, um, at prize evenings, at, at concerts and so on, um, we had these little cars, which was, you know, how did you, how did you find the concert, what could we do um, better, and, and so on. Um, and we got stuff that, if you're a parent, and you've sat through a prize giving, you might be able to relate. Um, 
do you think that parents wanted it to be longer or wanted it to be shorter? Yeah. So it turns out when you're sitting there going, look, I really, really love my kids. And I really, I'm really proud of what they're doing here. But like it's quarter past ten and we've been here for three hours and you know, so I, I thought maybe I was just I just thought that because I'm a bad parent. But it turns out that Aunt Grammar is full of bad parents who all thought the same thing. So this is, this is easy. Our parents are telling us that they want these things to be shorter. Let's just make them shorter. Um, similarly, we did, a, they, we did a thing about the, about the speakers. So, Prize Day, there's, there's usually a speaker. And they come from different backgrounds. They come from different, some of them come from academia, some of them come from sports, some of them are alumni from the school. Um, you know, and we over time just measured how the speakers were in <coughs> What we learned was that by a distance, the most popular speakers were former pupils who haven't gone on to like, be prime minister or something, but had just got themselves interesting jobs. So the school was able to make really good um, decisions about prize day. We're not going to ask you know, some high-flying dude who nobody knows. We're going to get a former Aunt grammar school uh, kid back, and they're going to tell us about it. So just by listening, the parents of the Aunt grammar kids, they just, they just give us the answer. And so they were able to feed that back in and make prize day a much more enjoyable um, experience. We did something similar with, with Firmus Energy. Um, so, so Firmus Energy, uh, well, you know, you know who they are, but what they do, they, they bring gas to people's homes. And they were interested in um, what it was like to try and be a customer of Firmus Energy. Um, and again, unsurprisingly, we went and we spoke to Firmus Energy customers, and we spoke to people who were considering Firmus Energy, and guess what happened? They told us the answer. They told us exactly what it was like to be a customer or to try to be a customer. And so Firmus were able to build their customer experience around what the customers told them. Here's the thing that you found. Um, they wanted them to fully understand and define the product that they were buying. They, um, they wanted to understand and assess the deciding factors, which were a combination of convenience and price and process and so on. They needed easy information gathering. Um, it's, it's a big deal ripping out an oil, an oil fired boiler and getting in gas. You've got to rip stuff out, you've got to change things around. They wanted to know what was involved. We needed to understand the difference between connecting and, and getting um, a flow. So there's, there's a wholesale bit and there's a consumer bit. Useful post conversion communication and help and support pre and post conversion. I don't, I don't have time over to fill them all, but here's some of the things. You should have looking for information on the product, gas, and its benefits. Option for further reading. You want to know who firm us are. The, 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 on the website as it was, they weren't directed down a specific path. Um, you usually want to save money. They want more information on tariffs. They want to know what grants and incentives are available. So I just I share this just to let you know, if you ask customers, they'll give you the answer. And when you see it on the screen, it's almost self-evidently obvious. But there's just something brilliant about knowing that Firmus Energy now I know that this is what their customers want to know at different stages of their buying journey. I won't through them all um, time at time for business. Okay, number two, um, speak with your sales and support people. So make sure if you're a business owner or a business leader, if you're going in contact with your customers yourself, Make sure you spend time with those who are. And those are people, your sales people or your customer support people. Because they're the closest to the cold face. I'll give you a quick example. We did some work a couple of years ago with, with APH. APH stands for Airport Parking and Hotels. They're the second largest provider of airport parking in the UK outside of the airports themselves. Their problem was that conversion on their mobile website um, was was really poor, particularly compared to their desktop website. We carried out um, a whole range of research methods, but I want to focus in on the one that is on my slide, which is we spent time with their customer care people. So their customer care people are all based on Gatwick. They have a team of about 30 um, who are on the phones all day, every day. And we, we went and we spent two days listening on calls. So listening on calls, spending time with the call center manager, understanding call volumes, understanding the main reasons that people and very quickly, we really got to understand the different types of people who were phoning up APAs to book airport parking. Um, now, interestingly, um, customers, uh, I won't say that they only fell into one or two categories, but there were two major themes. There was the hyper-organized customer, myself, spouse, and two children are flying Terminal 2, blah, 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 June 2023, you know, let's get it sorted now. So this person is looking for a bargain, it's highly price sensitive. And then you get someone, uh, yes, I think I'm flying sometime tomorrow, I think. We, there is a percentage of calls, I can't give you the exact number, but there's a percentage of calls which they get and we hear from people on the motorway 
all the way to the airport, and they've gone, uh, do you sort of parking? Uh, no, do you sort of park? Oh, right. And they, and they phone me. <laughs> um, and it won't surprise you to learn that these people are highly interested in detail and are price sensitive. Think these people are price sensitive? No, they're not. Think these people are interested in, should I get valet parking? Should I get the drop off and so on? No, they just want to park the car and go. So what we were able to do was we were able to recognize that if someone was booking parking in the next 24 hours, they had a different set of needs and a different set of questions and a different set of buying motivations than the people who are booking um, over here. So we, we, did a, we, we made a range of recommendations on their mobile app, but, but for the purposes of this, one of the ones that we did was if someone enters in, you know, I want to park from this date and time to this date and time, if the opening date and time was within 24 hours, they could take about a different path on the app. Than, than the people who, who were beyond by, because we listened to customers and we recognized that their needs and questions were different depending on when they were, when they were found. So uh, we did we great result that project, um, conversion went from 1.1% to 2.9%. Okay, uh, number three, um, this, is, this is a big one. Map the experience from the outside in. So one of the difficulties with running a business, is, as we all know, is you get so ingrained in your business and you become so expert in your area that it's difficult to see the world from the outside. It's difficult to know what it's like to be a customer who doesn't know as much about your business as you do. It's difficult to know what it's like from, from them hearing in. Um, and one of the best ways that you can do that is to develop what we call an experience map. Um, and an experience map talks about all the things that are happening from the customer's perspective as they begin to engage with you and then buy from you and continue their journey um, as a customer. So here's a nice example here. Um, as a customer is defining a product, um, there are factors by which they will decide to switch or not. They will then gather some information, they will connect to the application, and then there's a sort of a post communication comms. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to map the customer's questions in a timeline which matches how they will engage with you. So we know that when the customer is uh, defining the product, that their insights and desires are to be more energy efficient, control over heat and water, and they want no benefits. Um, the customer um, action is often the going to a search engine and arrive on a landing page. And then there's some moments of truth. There's these little moments in the customer journey which are disproportionately important and which the customer will remember beyond, you know, long when the journey is, is complete, the customer will remember these little moments of truth. And all experiences um, of, of moments of truth. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. Um, let's go back to the max day experience. For me, um, a moment of truth every time I go to match day is when I hand my ticket, I go into the stadium, I go up the stairs to my seat. The moment you get to the top of the stairs and you can see the pitch is a moment of truth. Because in that moment, you know, what's the seat going tonight? Do we get a good view? Oh, wow, listen to the band. Can't wait for the match to start. That's just one of those moments that if you're designing a stadium, you want to get that moment of truth um, right. And then we start to think about solutions. What content, what functions, how do we communicate with the customer so that in that moment, we can give them what they need to empower them, to give them the information they require that will allow them um, to move on. I'll just briefly mention this guy. Um, I know short of time, this, this, this guy is so, he is so impressive and it's so relevant, I feel like it's, it's here. This guy is called Bill McCallion. Bill is um, the leading pediatric surgeon uh, in the Royal. And um, when he speaks, and I've, I've heard him speak a couple of times, when he speaks, he said that what he wasn't taught at, at medical school um, that was the most important part of his job. He didn't do that. So he, he's a pediatric surgeon, so he, he operates on kids who have chronic conditions, who've been, um, who have um, been in car accidents. He is, he is involved in kids' lives and parents' lives at the, at the toughest moments um, of, their, of their whole lives. He's right in the heart of that. And what he says is he, doesn't rea he didn't realize when he had medical school that the most important part of his job isn't the amazing stuff he does when a child is on an operating table. The most important part of his job is how he communicates with parents. In terms of letting them know what he sees, letting them know the prognosis, letting them know the process. And for parents who get that awful news that their child hasn't made it, the importance of him letting those parents know that he did everything that he could. So what he has learned, I mean, you, know, you talk about the product and the service not being experienced, this is just living proof of, of just the importance of what you do and how the people you do it for experience are just, are just so, so different. So that's, that, that's key. We want to we have a sense of the experience and see it from our customers, um, through our, our customers' perspective. Okay, number four. 
um, you go and ask people to buy again. In other words, if you give people a superior customer experience, if you look after them well, you listen to them, and you give them this delightful and superior experience that we've talked about, you have earned the right to ask them to put their hands back in their pockets. Um, and, and this is important because if you haven't looked after them well, you haven't earned that right. Um, and we see this all the time. So let's, let's go back to McDonald's if you'll, if you'll indulge me. When you go to McDonald's and you put your hand in your wallet, the person who's serving you will always ask you, would you like fries with ham? If you go to Burger King, they will ask you, would you like to go large for 40p? But every business has an equivalent of going large or liking fries. So you might say, um, uh, if you're on a website, the website will probably say to you, people who bought X, the thing you're interested in, also bought Y, all these other things. And it, you'll, if you're on e-commerce websites, you may or may not have noticed that the thing you've bought, X, usually has a really tight margin on it, so that, that retailer is not making much money. But all the things that people also buy, they have a really high margin on and it's really worth it by introducing that. So if you've got patterns of customer behavior, let your customers know that you've earned the right to say that to them. What about this? Just pick up the phone. How are we looking after you? Are you getting everything you need? And perhaps if you're the leader and you've got someone on your team who looks after that customer, you know, how, how's Dave looking after you? Are you getting everything you need? Is anything you can do better? You know, Dave's, Dave's reviews coming up next month. Uh, he's a good dad, so you know, I want to encourage him. But if there's anything you can do better, what can, what can you do? That, that, that means the world to customers that you phone them up and say, how are we looking after you? Um, what about this one? Do you know anybody who would benefit from our services? You know, we've done a, we've done a good job for you. Um, you know, you're in a certain sector, we do lots in that sector. Would you, would you be kind enough to make a couple of introductions? You, you've earned the right to ask the question, so don't be shy um, about asking. Um, uh, what about this for, for larger businesses? You know, you've always bought X from us, but um, my mate, uh, John, um, he looks after Y, we do that as well. Can I ask John to come and get a coffee with you? Again, you can only do that when you've earned the right to do it. So that's number four. Um, if, you, if you've done the hard part, which is providing this superior experience, then don't leave money on the table. Have the nerve, the bottle, to ask um, for your customers to spend more with And then the final one is just to, is to measure and improve um, over, over time. Um, this is, this is a, a key one. I have a case study that I won't get a chance to, to, to share with you. Um, but I want to kind of plant the seed that customer experience and taking it seriously um, is a lifetime's job. And that if you, if you buy into it, the reward that you get from listening to customers, letting them know you've listened, evolving and amending your service delivery and your experience based on what you've heard, letting them see that you've listened and changed, improving over time, what you do is you create an environment where your customer experience just gets slightly better and slightly better and slightly better month on month and year on year. And what you're doing is you're putting clear water between you and your, and your competitors because you've got yourself into this, listen, adopt, improve, Iterate, repeat, you got into this, you got into this loop. And the final thing to say in this is just, um, I think I've mentioned the board up here, yes, put customer experience on the agenda for your board. Of course your board's going to have to talk about finance and process and profit and loss and all, all that kind of stuff, but make sure you also talk about how do you treat your customers? What does it feel like to be a customer of this business? Okay folks, um, I'll end it to finish off with the, the takeaways, five things to take away to the office. Number one, listen actively to your customers. Number two, speak with your people who speak to customers every day. Three, not with experience from outside in. Four, ask current customers to buy again and advocate. And number five, measure and improve over time. Thank you very much. We're into the time for the break now. If there's a, maybe a couple of questions that anybody wants to ask, or we're going to be a, yeah. Just one question. Whenever you're going about your research, collecting your time, Experiences. Do you need your question quite open ended so that they can sort of um, lead the way in terms of what's on their mind or are you quite specific and what information you want to gather? Um, well, uh, there's, there's two things there. Um, the first thing to say is that you can, you can measure your customer's opinion by asking questions, people talk about. But you can also observe, you know, so, so I mean, I'll go back to hospitality. Um, one of the things I love when I'm having a hospitality experience. Um, is a manager who walks the beat, you know? So, and particularly in holidays, you know, if you go to maybe Spain for your family holidays, you'll often see in the hotels, you have a, you have a hands-on manager who's just observing. So, you know, the first thing I would say is you can learn a huge amount by observation as well as asking questions. So, so observation is um, a mix. 
But to your, to your, your question, we would, we would typically use a combination of, of open and closed questions. So you know, I'll, go, I'll go back to the, um, I'll go back to Anthem Grammar Prize Night. You know, we ask the question about the length in a closed way, you know. So was the, was the length of time just right, too long, too short? But at the same time, we ask the question of the speakers in an open way. How would you rate the next speaker? What do you take? What do you take away? So a combination of open and closed questions, depending on what you want to learn, um, will will work. So you can use that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Call. Sure. Go ahead. I think you're maybe just slightly ahead. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I know it will be a continual project your customer experience but like how often like would be a yearly audit i suppose of your customer experience be what you would recommend um or how often do you think it should be done well i i, I think your starting point is the experience map because what the experience map often reveals is that there are there's lots of stuff you'll be doing well but there's every chance there will be there will be pinch points where customers aren't really feeling the love I'll give you an example. Um, Firmus Energy, there's typically uh, six to ten weeks between signing the dotted line and getting gas. And Firmus Energy use fitters who aren't employed by Firmus to do that. So Firmus are feeling really out of control here, but they know that customers are feeling really on love during that, during that period. So, that, so there's an example of where you look at the experience map, there's loads of positives, there's a few things which could be improved, and then you've got this big negative dip. So that, that just that visual representation just tells you we need to sort that sort that um, uh, right right now. So sometimes things are urgent and you just got to got to get on. So I think once you get that experience map, that tells you the extent to which things can be improved or where or, or opportunity lie, lies. Because you know on your experience map you can you can sometimes see you know negatives. Customers are grumpy at this stage, but sometimes customers can be positive and you can think, do you know what? We can take that positive. We can really like them, and, and our competitors can. Um, so I, I would just say, as, as long as it stays on the agenda, I think, and you know, an experience map drawn out, I think a rhythm will emerge, and just, I just trust your instinct in the room. I can see everybody wants coffee, so we just got one more. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, customer survey, online, phone, face to face. Oh, I'll try. I'll try not to give a consultant's answer, and, and, and I bet I will. Um, so the, it, it depends what you want to learn. So, so you know, the, the starting point for the research would always be we've, we've, we've drawn out our we've drawn out our, our, our map. Um, we've got a, we've got a sense of the process that the customers go through, but we can see some areas where we would like to where we like to learn more. So you know, it's different B to C. Um, it's different across different industries and sectors, and I think I think it's different in terms of um, how of other relationships you have with your customers. So some businesses, the CEO would just phone up their top ten customers and say, "How are you happy?" But other businesses who perhaps have thousands of customers, maybe an online service better. And what you might then do is if there are if there are people who reply with with responses at the extremes, either incredibly unhappy or very happy, well then you might get a phone call and you might follow up with them. So there's, there's different ways you different ways you can, you can do it. Yeah, I think squeeze one more in. Do you find is there a sweet spot for the amount of questions that you would ask? Because you know you're sat and you felt something out and there's 50 questions on. That's Okay, get it done. Whereas if they ask three questions, maybe you're not gathering enough information. Do you have a general sweet spot of, of uh, a length of, or volume of questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, where, 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 where people are unsure how many questions they should ask, there, there is a, a three-question killer combo that we often use, um, which, which is something along the lines of, um, you would ask, no, why are you here? So what do you want to achieve? Um, number number two, where are you going to the achievement? Um, and if not, why not? And number three, what's the one thing we can do better? So there's definitely a need to make your surveys and your questionnaires as short as you, as you possibly can. And if you're not quite sure where to start, that three question combo is very very powerful for us because people open up, it opens up stuff, and you can then you can even plan future stuff. Again. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. I'm sure everybody likes to give them a big hand. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'll see you.